Greetings Hello. to everyone. Welcome to Bible study at First Baptist Church, Gainesville, Florida. For those who are here, thank you. For those who are watching online, I know that Liz Piazza watches every Sunday afternoon. Liz, good to see you, although it'll be, it'll be on Monday because Olivia's gone today to get that out for us. Okay. I don't know y'all, none of y'all are busy on Sundays. Sometimes I am. I'm grateful for you all. Um, let me start with a word of prayer, and then we'll move into some of our discussion related to um, uh, this event today, our yeah, Bible study. Let's pray together. So, Lord, today I just recognize that I'm a little scattered, and so I just pray that you will just settle me down as we begin to study your word from Philippians. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will help us to build a conversation as we think about how we can um, be sold out for you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now that I've heard, you've heard say this, I think you can hear me when I move away from here. So I'm going to do that. So I want you to think about this question. Think about a moment when you were absolutely sold out, all in, for something. A job, a hobby, um, a vocation, a task, um, something that was really important to you. So, anybody have, some, anybody have something that they might, might want to share about that was a moment when you were sold out for something? Involved in it? Yeah, something? All right, I got I got this microphone. So you got you got to tell me what was it? Tell yeah, just tell me. <laughs> well, <coughs> everyone in um, this you're not going to hear. This is for there. Yeah. Dave and I always had a boat, and we always liked boating. And he had a brother who lived in the Keys, and he used to do scuba diving. So David would go with his brother, but he had no fear. But we had to get certified in order to do it legally. So I was determined that I was gonna do that. Well, what I found out when I had to do my free ascent from 30 feet, mm -hmm. that I was very claustrophobic. <clears throat> so I knew I wanted to do it. I wanted to get my license that I could do it so I could do it at my um, comfort level, which was never 30 feet. But I did the free ascent once and I never had to do it again. He had to do it more than once. Ah. So, but y'all, so y'all, so, so scuba diving was something that you loved. That yeah, eventually don't do, it don't do it well. But you, but uh, there was a time <laughs> right. when scuba diving was it. Right. I, I mean, was determined that I could get through it because that was the determination. The last thing you had to do to get certified. Yeah. There was one year um, when I lived in the mountains that uh, I challenged my church and I kind of made this a public statement that I was going to hike. 50 four mile hikes in a year. And so that meant I had to go out and, and hike every week. And I had one trail that was not too far from my church. And I would, and hike, if I hiked down it and hiked back, it was about four miles. And so um, that was what I did for a year. And I was sold out for it. I did it. After that, I was like, I've done hiking for a while. Okay, I was hiking in the rain, in the cold. I was, you know, doing a little bit. So that was, but, you know, that was what I did. What about this? What is it that is about being all in or sold out that brings excitement or joy? It, that can, does, does something that you do change if you have a sense of being bought all in or sold out about it? It's like a... Can, it challenge a challenge yourself. All right, I see. Give me, give me, a, give me some. You get, you keep shaking your head. Give me some. Oh, I was give, just going to say, I fast every Monday, so I start on Sunday evening at 7 p.m. and go till Tuesday morning at 7. So that's 36 hours, and I do it. It's a spiritual fast, and because it is a prayer for three different individuals, I do it for that purpose I cannot eat yeah I can't break it it's 
I'm I'm all in. I'm sold out. Yeah. And it's hard. It is challenging. I don't like it, and sometimes. <laughs> but I but you know whenever and occasionally I forget and I go get some. Yeah. I have ordered food <laughs> at a takeout place and gotten the food and realized, well, I'm in line. And <laughs> Wait a second. I'm, I'm on my fast. <laughs> yes. And I forgot <laughs> what day it is. Yeah. Right. So anyway, um, but I, I'm not sure about, it is a joy because um, because of the purpose. Because, because you're all in for it, it gives you the ability to make it through. I mean, because if you're not all in you're going to, and you're going to try to fast for 36 hours, by Sunday afternoon, by Monday afternoon, you're like, okay, I'm in line. I'm just going to stick it. I'm just, I'm just going to get the food and go, you know. I'm going to eat it. Yes, yes. Um, and so, so this is kind of what we're thinking about today that because this idea of being sold out all in for the gospel is kind of what Paul's talking about when he thinks about the people of um, in Philippi. So I mean, think about if you're doing the same task without the passion, would it change the way it wor you worked at? I mean, I think we talked about here. If you, if you didn't have that passion for that for um, um, for for fasting, and you knew that you were all in for that, you could easily say, "I'm done." If you didn't have a desire to want to be, you know, to be scuba diving with your husband and your friends and, and want to be under there, you, you wouldn't make yourself go on that 30-foot ascent. You wouldn't have gotten through those hard times of getting past some sense of claustrophobia to go, okay, I, I'm going to do this because it's important to me. When we're all in, it gives us that extra piece of saying, I've, I can get through this in some form or fashion. So we'll think about that a little bit. So we're going to, our passage today is in, found from Philippians. We're continuing to work our way through um, the, the first chapter. Um, so I'm going to read verses 20 through 26. And here's what I want you to listen for. Now I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have a board. I thought about getting a board out, but you couldn't read my writing if I did. So we'll just, um, we'll just talk. And those of you who have been around, you know. My writing's like that. But I want you to listen in these passages for the positive words Paul uses to describe his emphatic belief in what he's doing. He is sold out to the gospel. And so um, rather than, and, and that being sold out now has him in a prison cell. So listen to the way he does, the positive ways, and think about, and just pay attention to those words. I'm going to ask you for them in, after, we, after I read the passage. So, verse 20. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I to, am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you, for the Philippians. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you. Okay. Well, what were some of the positive words that Paul uses to describe his emphatic belief in what he's doing? Anybody get some of those words? Done. Eager. Eager. Hope. Hope. Boldness. What else? Boast. Boast. Fruitful. Fruitful. Joy. I saw joy in there. What's that? He was hard pressed. Hard pressed to get the things done abundantly. These words, I mean, so... What we may say, looking at Paul's circumstances, he's in prison, um, you know, um, we don't know how long, long, we don't know what's going to happen to him, there's a lot of uncertainty about it. 
But Paul, because he is all in for the gospel, has determined that whatever happens to him, whether I live or whether I die, is gain. I'm not speaking from it, so it happens every time about 20 minutes after turning it on. So we will just let it go. Um, so let's think a little bit about this, the difference in how we approach things when we approach them with being all in with something, sold out on something, and not. So think about a moment in church or in life or in work in which you were recruited to do a task in which you were not sold out. When your heart was not in it. So what are some of the words that describe, you don't have to tell me what it was, but what were some of the words that you might use to describe what that experience was like? Drudgery. Drudgery. Yeah. Bored. Frustration. Half-hearted. Frustrated. Dread. What? Mediocre. Mediocre. Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Fearful. Fearful. Yes. Lots, I mean, you know, we, we came, we, we figured this one out pretty fast, right? <laughs> we, we understand. We got, how, let's face it. How, if you were to have to measure yourself when you're doing a task, how often does it fit into this? versus fit into what Paul was describing, that moment when you feel like you're all in and excited and working towards something. Maybe more often we're, we're here. We're working out of areas that aren't our strengths, aren't our skill set, but, um, but, we, but we know it needs to get done, and so we just keep on doing it. Now, as pastor... It's in, in, all of the, in all the churches that I've worked in, a big part of what I've attempted to do, and we're not always successful, is to try to move more people out of this and into the other one. You often hear me talking about finding your sense of vocation. What is it that God has called you to do? How do I help you to do that more often? Because I know that when you are serving in a way that, finds, that you find joyful, that you find that you are being, um, that God is using you and you're finding that, um, uh, that, that, that there, there are fruits of it, man, you don't want to stop. And so I know that if I can get more people out of this and, and into the other, that, we're, that the church is going to be better, you're going to be better, the, your, your, your experience and your, your, your spiritual growth is going to be better. Now, there are, are there moments when we all need to have a place of service because we just need to get things done? Yes. And I recognize that. And um, sometimes you might have me ask you to do something. And I know it doesn't fit there. But we're just trying, I, I try not to make it go too long. But I know that when, if I can move it to the other, that's going to be a better place for you as a church member and as a follower of Jesus. So let's think about those different moments. That moment when you are all in and you find the joy in doing it. And that moment when you're just half-hearted and you're doing it because you're supposed to. And there's a sense of drudgery or boredom. What is the difference between the task, the task with passion and the task without passion. What makes the difference between drudgery and joy, between boredom and energy? I think you look at the end results. You know what the results are going to be. A good example, that uh, uh, yard sale that we did. Pat and I were involved in that thing. I, I really didn't want to do it because it's a lot of detail work. Right. But we knew the results would be revenue especially for the young people. So uh, it was a, uh, when you look at the end results, after it's all over with, you say it was worth it. But while you're going through it, it was a drudgery. So one of the things, and I'm just going to quote it on here, is that when, when you're able to look at the end results, and you, that, that can give you the passion to get through the drudgery. Because you know that what you're doing has a positive result on the end. And it helps you even when you're not working in areas that necessarily may become more naturally at working with a more detailed area. But you know that if you can do this, the results are going to be really positive. And you want to see that take place. And it pushes you through 
to help, to help see that. So that's a, great, that's a great example. What are some other things that make the difference between drudgery and joy? So if there's people there, and that, and that, and though, and they, and it may not be your passion, but if it's their passion, you can you can live into that. You you find that energy through by by being a part of them. Yeah. With passion, you have a joy. Mm hmm Without passion, the joy is just not there. Right. You know, and I think sometimes too is, is it's when you're working out of areas that um, come more naturally. You know, if I'm working, you know, uh, if if, if uh, um, details are my strength, and I find myself working out of that place of strength, I'm going to find a lot more energy to be able to do that than when, when I'm doing the other part. Cause let me tell you, details are not my strength. So whenever that, whenever my job requires me to focus on those kind of parts. I feel like I've worked all day, and I may have worked a couple of hours, you know. But it, it, being with folks, I can be I can be in a hospital or working with individuals or studying the scriptures for hours, and I, you know, by the time it's done, it's, it's been it's been a great day. But give me two hours of working on administration sometimes, and I feel like I've done a whole week's worth of work, you know. And that that energy is coming from some of the, the giftedness or strengths that we have. I'll tell you something else: is whether or not you're being paid to do it. If it's something you don't want to really do. Because it's drug, drug, you know, because it's just too difficult. Right. You're being paid to do it. You have a different attitude. <laughs> so m money can change that, yeah. but not always. Yeah. There are times when you're getting paid. So you, you've been you've been around people who are getting paid for something, and you know, that's not what they want to be doing. You know, and um, but but it does. But knowing that result that. If you know that what you're doing, you know, helps pay the bills, helps keep the family fed, helps do, I mean, you can do a lot of things knowing that, that that end result, as Tim said, that's the passion and it gets you through those other parts. Yeah. So in verse 20 and 23, we, we see Paul's convictions. So I want you to, I want to read these passages and, and see what is his passion. All right. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. How would you describe, as Keith thought here, how would you describe Paul's conviction? What is Paul convicted of? What, what, what is his passion? Christ. Christ. Saving souls. Living for Christ. Living for Christ. I mean, he is passionate, but, by, but that by, by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted as now always in my body. He wants Christ to, he, there is, he is so sold out to Jesus that he wants whatever happens to him to be able to tell the story of Jesus more effectively. If he stays in prison, he wants that to speak boldly for Christ. If he dies in prison, he wants that to speak, be, to speak boldly for others for Christ. And this, I mean, this, past, this verse here, verse 21 for to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. Um, in your um, study books, they talk about that as a as that um, the in in Greek, it's living Christ, dying gain, literally. And, that, and, and I'm talking about the kind of the sort of parallelism of this sort of poetry that you know you got living and dying, and Christ and gain. But, and we normally would think that living and dying are opposites, right? But for Christ, I mean, for, for Paul, he doesn't see them as opposites. He sees that, that, that both of them give honor and glory to the thing that he's most sold out to, which is Jesus Christ. That in all these ways, he, tells that he gets to boast boldly of Christ. Your um, writer of, of, the, um, of our lesson says this, Paul was not afraid of life or death. He just wanted to magnify Christ and that brought to him great joy.
to magnify, you, you can see that, that passion to magnify Christ came out and then all that he did and said. Paul was convinced of the necessity of remaining here to serve the kingdom, but was completely unafraid of death. He felt like God, that, that Christ still had, that, that there was still a need for him to be on earth, that he was, even though he was in prison, that there were still things that God was doing in him, and that he felt like it was necessary. I'm sure that, I mean, he, he wrote other books that ended up in our New Testament after he wrote Philippians. And so there was a need for him to be here, but whatever happened, he was okay with God being able to, to with what God did in his life. And that's a, that's a change in perspective for all of us, right? To begin to get to that place where we're so sold out to Christ that whatever happens in our life, life or death, that we see that as a gain for Jesus. I mean, not, it's, it's, it's not, while it is so easy to read that verse is not as easy to live it, right? right. It's not, I mean, there, there, is, there is a fear of these things. But Christ, but there is something about that trust in Jesus to know that he has our life here and he has our life in the parts that we don't understand, that we don't know. And that death. But sometimes it, the most difficult things that we go through, at the end we look back and say, thank you God for helping me. And so it's a, it's a motivating thing, even though we dread very much what's happening. Right. Uh, we are better and stronger as a result of it. So when we go through these tough times, we dread it, it's hard, but we can look back on the end and say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. You know, not, you know as much as we hear the positive language of Paul, I don't think we also don't need to... Um, think that he's that is not that, that this is easy that living in prison is easy that whatever the challenges of this life are easy I mean it, it they're still hard I and mean, they're still physical there's still pain there's still he's still separated from the people that he loved he still can't be where he wants to go you know there, there are these are that it just because things um that God is using things doesn't mean that they're not going to, that they're, they're, they're going to be easy or that we won't be afraid. Part or, of the time he was in chains. Uh, uh, part of the time he was tortured. Right. I mean, I mean, all of the, I mean, you know, when, when you're getting stoned, that, and by, by real stones, those are, that, that's painful. You know, it creates bruises and pain and, and, but it, you know, God, but to then to be able to see those moments, to look back on, as you said, Bobby, and say, here's where God was at work. Yeah. I mean, this is a big question for us. You know, all of us are at a different stage of our life. Um, someone told my dad one time, who, as he was fighting cancer, Mr. Spivey, all of us are dying. You just know what's killing you. I mean, there's a place where we all are in this, we all are in a phase of dying, aren't we? I mean, none of us are going to get beyond it unless Christ comes back. Um, have we ever reached a point in our life where you have no fear of death? How does that change your willingness to, to sell out, not to see out, but to sell out completely to serving Christ? When we see that Christ has us in his hands, and whatever we, whether we live or die, how does that change how we view our own death? And then how does that change how we view how we live for Jesus? You know, I think about Brother Nor. But, you know, I mean, your husband, that all of a sudden my name, Herb, Herb what, I, for some reason, Norm was going, was going right into the point. Brother Herb, that um, there was never a fear of death. I just all you know, every time you came to, I came to visit, it was always about the singing. Always about the, how Christ was holding him dear. Always about praying. Not, you know, every time you want to pray for him, he was praying for somebody else. You go to visit him in the hospital, and he's praying for all the nurses and their family. He's singing, you know. He had figured something about this out. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're experiencing it, it's a little different. And now that I've been through that with him, I'm a little less afraid. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, to be less afraid of it. Yeah. So let's think about final passage, final verse. 
Think about this. I'm going to read it in, in, in several different translations. So let's think about what is Paul saying in this verse from the NRSV. He says, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. So I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. What is he saying? And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Then when I visit you again, you will have great reason to take great pride in Christ Jesus because of me. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Christ Jesus for, you, for me by my coming to you again. What do you hear Paul saying in this passage? So he's in prison. But what's he expecting? He's expecting to get out and go visit them. And what is, and what is his um, visit to them? What is he wanting his visit to mean to those people, that, the people in the church in Philippi? That there, there, there is victory through Christ. That when you see me, you can celebrate, you can take pride that Christ is doing more than you ever thought because I wasn't supposed to come. That when we begin to look at how God is working in our lives, we can take um, pleasure, peace, as seen when he overcomes those kind of circumstances. When we get through the end of something and say, thank you, Lord, for getting us through. I, I, it was hard. I, I didn't know if I could get through it, but when, I, but when we got through it, thank you. I see how you were able to bring me through. We can celebrate because he has gotten us through. When you see me again... There's reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. He wants the Philippians to rejoice in their, in his arrival, in God's work, in his life, because it's, it's becomes a, um, a symbol of what he's also doing in their life as well. So we think about how we might utilize this passage today is to think about this. So here's one way. If we were to be sold out all in for Jesus, how would our daily lives change? What would we be doing? So if we were to move, and I would say, if we were just to move one more step to being sold out for Jesus, not even to say, oh, I will never be to what Paul was doing. I can't ever be that sold out. But if we were to take just one step toward being more sold out to Jesus, what would our daily lives be like? How would we spend our days? How would, what would we obsess over? What would be our challenges and our opportunities? Maybe that might give us something to think about today to take this passage from Paul to the Philippians and use it for something to, to engage us in our life of faith. Questions, comments, thoughts? You know, one thing that interested me was that why Paul wrote this particular letter in this particular way. Because Philippi had become a Roman city. Yes. And uh, the people, and he was in a Roman jail. Yes, Roman jail. So he has, he has something to bring to these people who are now closer under the thumb of the Romans. And I think he felt like he had to encourage them living in the atmosphere they were living in because they were so close to the Roman government. Well, I think you're right. I mean, I think the fact that he's in a Roman jail, it is a, it is a Roman town. Um, and, but I think there's also, there was something unique about that church. And there, and, and there, there, was, a, there was definitely a bond. You know, he, Paul started lots of different churches, but there was a bond between him, him and that church and the people in Philippi. And I think that, that drives part of that conversation as well. He's not only helping them to know how to live under Roman oppression or bondage or whatever, but also how to find joy even in those circumstances. And there was a, yeah. Other thoughts? Questions? Yes? I think Herb is just a wonderful example for us of how to live and how to die. I mean, for, for you to tell that story about how he prayed for the nurses and, you know, it, that, that's just the, really a touching story a, a right among our midst, you know, to have someone really living uh, this out, what we're talking about. 
and it's fitting and it's fitting for the the life of her but he, he he served for so many years and he you know how many different interims after he retired did y'all do 15 well we were in interim ministry for 15 years okay eight or nine churches, eight or nine churches. And with the presbyterians the last 10 years yes but you know you know, so he served in all those different ways, and then he continued to serve in our church. And then everyone who came in contact, we all we all of us came out blessed because we were in his presence. We went to, to take care of him, and he always blessed us. And even today, to even to continue to tell the story is just another another way that he continues to bless us along the way. Praise God. What kind of prayer needs do we have today that I can offer up before we go? Anyone else? praying for folks. I want to pray for Brenda as we mentioned today as she travels to Haiti this coming week. I want to pray for our BBS, our leaders, our workers, our kids who make their way in. Um, others only have more personal prayers. Yes, Ms. Barbara? Um, Tony McCoy is in the hospital with a stomach, uh, stomach. Is she, is, I knew she went to the ER. Do they keep her? Yeah, um, they keep okay. Her. Connie McCord, Tim Whiteside and Connie. So Connie's still in the hospital. Trevor, it's so great to see you, man. Man, you look good. I'm, you haven't changed a bit during COVID. I'm so glad you're here. When I saw you come in, I was so excited to see you here. So we're grateful that you're here. Anything you want to say to us? Uh, not really. Okay. <laughs> well, listen. Um, you, you're around two great folks, so I'm glad, I'm glad they got you here today. So, well, let me have a word of prayer for us as we go. Now, oh, gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the blessing of this day, for the blessing of, of being able to study your word, to be able to hear from Paul, and allow Paul to continue to teach us to be more like you. And Lord, I pray that you will challenge us this week to take one step of being more sold out to Jesus, one step of being all in as his disciples. So Lord, that you will take those moments, those steps, and allow us to find our, our place of service for you, where Lord, we can, so that our lives can become more like Christ, and we may speak as he speaks, that to live is Christ and to die is gain. May you teach us, Lord, the power of these words each and every day. Be with us as we go. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank we appreciate you. everybody.